Good afternoon in Poland, uh, good morning uh, in the USA and uh, Colorado. Uh, my today guest is the former uh, NBA player, uh, Beno Udrich. Dobry dan, Beno. Dobry dan. <laughs> good job. <laughs> and um, thank you very much for um, uh, for agreeing to be in the uh, Opal Stories from the NBAers. All, always uh, uh, really good, and I'm really curious about uh, those uh, memories from the players uh, from the time they spent in the NBA, but not also in NBA, but also uh, in the time uh, before the NBA. So. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious for you as a um, uh, Slovenian uh, uh, player, who was your favorite player uh, when you were a kid? Uh, well, when I was growing up, obviously I, I looked up at some Slovenian players that play for Olympia, but like my favorite in Europe was Dražen Petrovic. Um, and then obviously the NBA as much as we could have, you know, once one game a month that you could see on a, a, a satellite uh, TV that we had, uh, you know, everybody liked Michael Jordan. So just growing up and then, you know, a couple others like Kevin Johnson was one of my actually point guards that I like uh, played in Phoenix. Um, but yeah, Drajan Petrovic was like one of the guys from Europe. Yeah. I remember when I started my journey with, uh, with the basketball, not only NBA, uh, we got here in Poland uh, team uh, in the city when I grew up, uh, uh, Trev Sopot, uh, then Prokon Trev Sopot, and we've got one player from Slovenia, G Goran, Jago Goran Jagodnik. Yeah, Jagodnik, yeah, he's a good friend of mine, yeah. We played together. Oh. Yeah, in Pozala, yeah. Before, before he went to Poland, he was in Pozala. And uh, yeah, we played together a few years. He was the vet. Very good scorer. Yes, I remember his uh, ability to score three points. Uh, so it was really nice to see him uh, in our team. And yeah. it, it, he yeah. thanks us a lot. And uh, when I look uh, at your uh, career, basketball career before the NBA, um, you won uh, the league and the cup uh, in Slovenia mm -hmm. with uh, Union Olympia. Then uh, yeah. also the same it was in Israel with Maccabi Tel Aviv. So how this um, winning um, attitude and this uh, and this uh, how this help you uh, with uh, gain this uh, aim as being in the NBA and being uh, so uh, in the court? I mean, it always helped. Yeah, I mean, it helped me a lot. You know, just um, but then I would say it. Uh, like it, in some moments it didn't help me, you know, like it's, it's like a kind of a, it's a blessing and a curse because like growing up being, you know, as a young player, starting with the, obviously starting in Pozela and then uh, transfer to Olympia and becoming like a member of the first team and then winning championship in Slovenia and winning cups in Slovenia, you know, it was, um, it was very rewarding um, for myself and like, you know, tasting those winning feelings, you know, is going forward. That's what I really wanted to do. It's to win, to be in something to win. Um, you know, because when you're young, you're just like, oh, the most important thing is to partic participate, not to win, right? And and at the young age, I start like feeling that like, oh, how great it is to to win. So, you know, and then going to Israel, winning there, like, you know, definitely... Um, I mean, then I went to NBA, to NBA to San Antonio, and I won a championship there. So I'll tell you something that like that, all that winning in like, you know, I would say what six, six years, seven years of my career, beginning of my career, it actually did not help me uh, play for my national team. <laughs> to be honest, you know, because uh, uh, when we got to the national team. I looked around the room before we went in front of the media and stuff. And like, I was like, oh, uh, we have a really good team. Like we can win a medal. Um, but the message from the people, you know, above were like, hey, when you go to the media, just tell them that our goal is to be, to qualify to the next round. And then whatever else we get, it's a success. And I'm like, okay, for, you know, and at that time I was already in NBA, so I was like, 
okay, so I'm going to give two to three months practicing twice a day and, you know, not being like I'm home in Slovenia, but I can't see my family because it's like a very time consuming, you know, being with the national team. So I'm going to give you all my summer to be eighth, seventh. Like I thought we were in this to win. And, you know, then if we don't win, deal with this disappointment, you know, and like, so yeah, that didn't help me play for the national team because I was always felt like, okay, I'm going there. I'm not used hundred percent. I'm not going to be giving my hundred percent because I'm not going to be able to give hundred percent. So why are we here? So I was always kind of a clashing with that. So like I said, you know, winning early in my career, it was a blessing but it was a curse as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you see the result of uh, Euro Cup, when Slovenia won the gold medal, mm -hmm. uh, were you surprised? Of course, you've got Luka Doncic, who were well known in Europe. I and mean, he was a great talent. But uh, did you expect it that this team could be so mm -hmm. high? Well, to be honest, like I hear stories, you know, and I was not really surprised. I, I was just happy, you know, that they finally. Uh, put the team together that like was able to and then the coach that came there Igor you know he put the roles in, to every player before we always have problems which player has certain role and stuff like that um, but I was just happy you know it was like well deserved they played great you know like I think everybody was surprised a little bit you know when you because like you had teams that were like on the paper better you know but their chemistry was not better. So chemistry is a, a big thing. And that the thing is, like, when in the previous years when I was playing, we had always great chemistry off the floor, but, like, on the on the floor, we never had a chemistry because everybody was, like, really good players and we didn't know what, what to expect. Like, what is my role? Like, why am I here? So, um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was just happy. I was just happy that they won, you know, and like um, we could have done it earlier, but like, you know, everything is written in the books and like it's, it is what it is, you know. <laughs> yes, that's right. And uh, when we uh, when we come back to uh, to the times when you were in the Europe, uh, do you think that somehow those uh, really nice uh, basketball CV uh, help Spurs to decided to select you in 2004 NBA draft. Well, to be honest, like I was like, so I went to, you know, I was with Olympia, and one of the agents saw me, and then I was in Maccabi. Um, but back then, there's like scouts. There were not a lot of scouts, you know, in like here in overseas to look at the, the European players. There were some. But not for players kind of like me, you know. I was like a good player, but like I was kind of an off raider. So I remember that last year before going to the draft, I was playing for uh, Olympia Milano. Uh, at that time it was Braille Milano. Um, and, um, you know, we, we were in Italian uh, league, um, like almost got to the playoffs. I got there like at the end, like I actually the beginning of the middle of the season so we kind of progressed up uh, um, on the standings but like missed I think uh, the playoffs for like maybe two games um, so yeah I went to the draft there uh, after that year and I was kind of off the radar so not a lot of people actually like knew me so when I went to the Chicago pre-draft camp I won the MVP of the Chicago Chicago pre-draft camp uh, I did really well and that basically kicked off my you know okay people start like okay um, you know maybe there is something in this player so then I got a bunch of workouts uh, scheduled for different teams uh, I think it was like eight or nine workouts in 10 days uh, all over the United States and and yeah, and then San Antonio drafted me, yeah, first round. So that was great. Great feeling. So you came to the NBA with uh, 28 uh, first round pick. You mm -hmm. are a rookie, but with experience uh, um, much higher than uh, usually rookie came from the NCAA. 
-hmm. What did surprise you the most uh, in your first rookie season? Um... Well, to be honest, nothing really surprised me. I, like because the team is was so good chemistry wise and stuff like that. They just like um, they were everybody was helping me. You know the organization San Antonio, you know the Spurs. They were like really good. Like like they they help you in any way you need to be helped. You know, uh, so it was pretty easy transition, and I never have a hard time adjusting to where I live. You know, basketball was my life, so and we were winning, so that helps a lot. Um, <clears throat> I guess the only the harder part I I had was like, you know, we had certain uh, play calls that were like a little hard to for me to say at that time. You know, my English was good, I was able to communicate, but like it was when you have to say it in the pressure and like in the speed and stuff like that, and like. I had that was a harder problem, the hardest thing for me. But other than that, you know, I just went out there and play. And like, you know, I had players around me that make me better. And uh, hopefully I did the same for them, you know. Mm -hmm. And I remember that once uh, Bruno Sundov told me that uh, during his rookie season, uh, before he became accepted uh, by the, the veterans and the rest of the team, uh, there were, uh, there were, difficult times for him and he remember like Cedric Sabalos throw the ball to the to the different part of the stadium and he he oh. have to go there uh yeah, what that's were a, your that's a... different the difficult rookie tasks which you remember uh well like I guess like you know we had like a team that was veterans that were basically more focused on winning than you know messing with the uh, rookies you know, make it make the life harder on the rookies. Like that was not the case with the San Antonio Spurs. Like the only thing I know, so I was one of two rookies. So we were kind of uh, rotating, but like every shoot around. So that's like a day of the game. We had to go and um, uh, to get like donuts. Mm -hmm. so, so classic. So yeah, and um, you know, it was not donuts from one shop. It was donuts from two shops because certain players like donuts from one shop and certain from the other. So, and there was one thing, it was like more local, like everybody knows Krispy Kreme, but then there was like called uh, the donut shop called Shipley's. They're more like local, uh, like just in certain towns in the area in San Antonio. And that was like kind of an inland. It was not on the highway. So it took me extra 30 minutes to just go in and out. So like, you know, shoot around is a 10. And me being a rookie, I have to be there early, you know, to get my work done. So I had to like wake up like an hour before I had, I usually had to wake up just to go get donuts, you know. So uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was not, I, I was never a morning person. I am now, but never before. So like when I was playing, so that was a hard thing, but like, you know, it's, it comes with it, you know. But like to be honest, it, that doesn't happen anymore here. Like in in NBA now, rookies basically run the league. You know, like you, you guys getting younger, so so it's not anymore like that. Yeah. And did, did, do you remember that? Does this uh, do these donuts were really really good, or the taste was better because of this rookie sacrifice? Yeah. <laughs> no, they. I mean, they were okay. A lot of sugar, you know. So, um, but yeah, I was always. I always have a sweet tooth a little bit, so yeah, I liked it. Mm -hmm. And also, how do you remember your cooperation with the Greg Popovich? Great coach, but I think that he was really tough and expected a lot from the players. So at the beginning of your career in the NBA, was it uh, really difficult to find the, the, the common language with the coach? I mean, you know, he, he had like the authority and like... He's one of the he is the winningest coach in the NBA. And you know, he's a good good person. You know, he just like I always kind of looked at this, you know, like when the coach is stuff on you and he screams at you and like keeps you know telling you what to do and all this stuff, like he wants you to be the best you can be. So he actually like, you know, is behind you. Once when he stopped talking to you, then that's when you should start like start and like be like be, that's when you're in danger. That's when you should be like, oh my gosh, what's happening? You know, like so better when he's yelling okay. at you. 
yeah so when, when he's yelling with you he's like hey that's fine let me just do what he's telling me to do and like i know he's gonna yell at me and like he wants me to get better and to be the best version of myself on the court uh especially so once when he stopped yelling you're in trouble you know like then you know like he he's probably not really interested in you anymore as much as he was before that you know mm -hmm. so, yeah and in 2022 MBA i had a tough coach i had a tough coach in slovenia when i was growing up too you know it was mago saga then he he taught me a lot too and like he was the same pretty much the same way like he expected a lot from players you know and like a lot of people would would say like you know coaches like this uh you know they helped a lot of players but they you know made a lot of players hate basketball or something too so it's like you know it's like it goes one with one you know and if you're not mentally strong you know and that's why that's why tony parker was so great you know like pop was that was the hardest person pop was at like he went at him all the time he expected him and Pon tony always responded in uh you know like with a great performance and he kept growing and like that's why he's going to be a hall of famer you know so so yeah same with manu same with timmy i mean I don't know if you saw the Tim Tim Duncan jersey retirement. Um, I feel every player should like good, bad player, whatever player, uh, but like mostly star players should look at that one comment that Pop said during his speech on Tim Duncan's jersey retirement. It, he said like, "Tim Duncan, thank you for letting me coach you," and that's what like makes you think. Oh, what what does he mean with that? Well, Tim Duncan could be, you know, he was a first round pick. I mean, first pick in a draft. Like he could come there and like not listen to Pop and do whatever he wants. You see that a lot in young players. They think that they know everything. Um, but Tim he came there, you know, and he went to work and trusted the process and trusted the system that Pop put in. And, you know, look at him now, you know, he's one of the greatest. And the Spurs organizations, because of Timmy was the way he was, they were able to be, you know, very good team for, what, three decades. So, you know, not easy task to do. Yeah, that there was a rumor that it was really close that Tim Duncan uh, would be in Orlando Magic, but uh, it was this small Great. lack of the dot at the end of this uh, contract that uh, he wasn't uh, as Orlando Magic fan I'm not happy with that but the history yeah. shows that he stayed in the San Antonio and uh, the, the 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 other things is the history and you also played in uh, Orlando Magic for, for a yes. while for a season Hello, how do yes. you remember the time spent in Florida um I mean it was a good time you know it was very short I think it was like like two months two three months um you know but like i mean like i said before i never really cared where i live you know i was doing what i love doing and that's playing basketball um so yeah but it was good you know like i actually knew the coach at that time and the gm of orlando magic so um uh i played with the coach jacques Vaughn. he was a coach there and like i played with him in san antonio and then he was my coach in orlando and then uh, rob henningen he was a Actually, he just started working for the San Antonio my first year. When I got there, he basically got there. He just started working in the front office. Um, and then, yeah, then when I got to Orlando, he was a GM. So, yeah. So, yeah, it was a good time. But I guess that uh, the, the the cherry on the top of, of the cake was this time spent uh, with San Antonio Spurs. Uh, you won their two rings in 2005 mm -hmm. and 2007. So how much do you need to uh, sacrifice to achieve this, uh, the, this goals, those uh, championship? I think it's a lot of uh, not only hard work, but also pressure. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of pressure, a lot of hours. Um, and especially, you know, like as a young, when you were young, when you were like growing up, you had a season until, you know, June and then the summer hits, right? And then you're like, okay, I know I have off. I go go get to vacation and stuff like that. And, you know, it's 
here like the playoffs are just so much longer than they're they are in Europe usually. Um so especially if you go game seven, game six, you know, in every round, it's like it can be a very long process. Um but yeah, it was like uh, it was a it was hard, especially like once once when you like the last let's say four teams, two teams, like you don't travel as much, so your mind is not so much all over the place. Now you just focus, you know, and then you know basically you're the only like especially in the finals. I remember my first year going playing with Detroit. Like basically all nation, all the world is focusing just on two teams. It's not anymore 30 teams, you know, it's like two teams and like, it's a lot of pressure. Yeah, it's just like a lot of people like reaching out to you or whatever, you know, and it's just a lot of things that you have to kind of a block out and just be to, to be able to focus on actually what matters and it's basketball and like, you know, knowing all the stuff that you need to know. So to help you win the game. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's hard. That's why, you know, a lot of teams, they they can be really good in a in a regular season, but when the playoffs come, you know they can't get it right because it's like one little mistake can you know cause a big problem, you know. So, yeah. So after three successful seasons in uh, with Spurs, uh, mm -hmm. you f came from this let let's say championship peak uh, to the mm -hmm. different. Uh, level you played in california with sacramento kings you've got more minutes and also yeah. game played but uh, how would you remember that time because it was different uh, let's say winning culture yeah i mean listen everybody wants to win games um but just i was just surprised how different nba teams are from one team to another you know and like at that time, the Sacramento Kings were kind of in a rebuild mode, um, much younger team. Not my first year there. We had a decent team and like we played well, but then the next year was much uh, like a lot of young guys. And yeah, when I came there, you know, I was the only player that like came from like a, actually my second year specifically um, that like was on a winning team like the year before. And, like, I just didn't understand how can that be possible that, like, players are acting a certain way and, like, that it's some certain things were not addressed that they would be addressed in, with the Spurs. So it was kind of like a cultural shock uh, at first, you know, and then I just had to adjust and, like, understand. But still, like, for, like, four years being there, you know, we didn't win a lot of games, like... That took a lot out of me out personally because when you're winning and like, yeah, the season is long, but then you get this excitement and, you know, you win a championship. You're like, okay, it was worth it. You know, all that for this. Yes, I'll do it every year if I can. But then going like um, when you're not winning, I mean, you feel like the, even – when you're done in April, when you don't go to playoffs, you know, you're done in April, you feel like your season was two years long because of so many disappointments, you know, losing, frustration, you know, depression hits, whatever, you know, like you start looking yourself in the mirror, then you're looking around you, like what's happening, you know, and like, I mean, I always said like, you know, to be successful as a team, everything starts above, you know, and San Antonio, that was the case. I mean, Pop, you know, everything under Pop was like, you know, working the way it's supposed to work, I guess. And then in San, in Sacramento, it was different, you know. And I'm also curious how this uh, how this situation that you are not winning and in the April you are not uh, looking at the opponents in the the first and the other rounds of the playoffs. How does it? affect the mentality especially of the young players because a lot of got the talent uh, even hard work ethic but when you are not winning i think that somehow it's also changed uh, the the way how they playing well but that's the thing like you know that's why i said it comes from the top and 
you know, I think young players need more. They need structure, even if they don't want it. Because young players come in the league now and they think that they need minutes, that they want, they know what to do and stuff like that. And But that's not winning really, you know. So I think they need structure and like, you can give them some freedom, but they still need structure, you know, how you get to certain things, you know, and you, you like, they should be helped even if they think that they don't need help, you know. And I feel like a lot of players that I played with, like, you know, all these young players, they're drafted. I mean, you know, all these teams, they do their due diligence, they research. And when they draft players, all these players are talented. And they all these players have potential to be very, very good players. But yeah, if you don't give them structure and guidance, you know, you can actually you know, damage the players and you don't teach them to play the right way and you don't teach. So then they struggle wherever they go after that, you know, and then they're out of the league or they just, instead of being really good players, they can just be an average player, you know. And, you know, when you, new young players coming every year, they're already average, you know, at that point. So like teams, okay, we're just going to go and get a new, new player, you know, a young player. So, so yeah. I think if you really believe in young players, you know, when you draft and stuff like that, you got to guide them, you got to give them direction and, you know, a certain system that, like, they need to be in and, you know, just trust the process. But, you know, that's not just on coaches and stuff. That's on players as well. They just need to be um, a little bit more accepting acceptable like to some critics and then some guidance too you know so it goes both ways everything goes both ways in life in basketball wherever however we look at it you know you gotta like you went hiking this is like just as it might be a stupid example but when you went hiking in uh triglau you had to respect the mountain and the mountain gave you respect back right and so like i'm just saying it's just like everything in life is two ways you know so uh, in the Pelicans uh, last season, you were responsible for player development. Now you are with Atlanta Hawks and uh, you are scouting. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look at the players, do you've got uh, potential NBA players uh, for your team? Do you've got some, let's say, the profile of the player you need to find? Or mm -hmm. does the team also... Uh, look for your instinct to find the player could suit to the team or have got this uh, ability to be to've got successful career in the NBA sometimes not even be a star but a good role player yes uh, I mean yeah as a scout like yeah I, last year I was with the Pelicans with a, a player development assistant coach and my my goal just in my mind like what I want to do it when I'm working out the players I want to help them, you know, understand the game, you know, work them out the way they would be used in our system, in our game. Um, you know, where would they get shots from? That's where, like, so the players can kind of, a, and I try to put them in an uncomfortable situation because that's what the game pretty much is and try to help them be more comfortable in that uncomfortable situation, if that makes sense. And, you know, some players are, okay with that and then some players a lot of players they just want to feel comfortable when they're working out but my 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 belief and my thinking the way i think is like if you're not put in an uncomfortable position not just as a player but just in a as a human in general like you don't grow as 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 fast or as you know as good as you would if you're in an uncomfortable situation if you let's say want to write an email and you're like, oh, I don't want to write it because I don't want to write it wrong. Well, you're never going to learn. You're never going to be become comfortable with that, you know, or something, you know, it's just like little things. So that's what I was doing with Pelicans. And then this year, yes, I am scouting and with the Atlanta Hawks. And my job is pretty much just give my input on the players that I see, um, you know, how they perform uh, at certain game that I see. And then what I see them going forward to be like a, what the role they would play, um, you know, like what they need to work on and stuff like that. And then 
uh, and yeah, it's majority of times is like looking for a role player, you know, rotation. And then once when we get closer to like tra- trading deadline, you kind of go to like, okay, like if we want to improve, this player might be more efficient in certain areas or the way we play. And uh, if you like, let's say trade for a star and stuff like that, like what star would be better fit for our system and our team? Um, but yeah, just it's a it's a different job, but like you know, I'm very excited about it because I get to like see the different side of basketball as well. You know, this is more front office, and coaching is more you know like coaching sides, not so much as front office. So so yeah, it's an exciting job. So how your experience from uh, from NBA courts uh, as a player help you uh, in your new position? Mm-hmm. How do the uh, players help me? How your experience from being a player help you to to oh. look at the the other young prospects and to find yeah. this the right person? I mean, you know, it's just I maybe see things like differently to some people that didn't play, you know, but then pl- people that didn't play see things differently. So I think uh, like we have a good uh, mix of both. Um, so it's always good to see a different uh, point of view on the players, you know? So I just like a lot of times I'm like, yeah, well, he needs to work on certain things in your shot. Like he doesn't set his feet the way he's supposed to, you know, I get into like little details. I like try to go to in little details and stuff like that. Um, uh, but yeah, it definitely helps, you know, just to see it. Sometimes maybe I'm too quick to judge. Uh, um, but, um, you know, but it's again, it's like a learning, you know, like it's, I never been a scout. I didn't really know how to like get into this, but like I said earlier, like, it's kind of like, it's an uncomfortable situation because I never done this. Uh, but you know, I'm trying to put myself in a in a position to be uncomfortable and learn and get better at it. And you know, once when I start, like this was this is actually my first month work doing this, so I'm sure I'm gonna get some feedback and it's gonna be good or bad, whatever it is. You know, I'm I'm willing to hear it and you know, do. I always wanted to do the best I can, you know. And at the end of the day, I, again, I'm helping the team. You know, I've always been a team player, and so am I now. You know, I'm a team player, so how can I help Atlanta Hawks win basketball games, you know? Because, like, our goal is to – I mean, I, I think every team's goal should be, oh, let's go win a basketball game. Let's go win – you know, let's get to the playoffs. Let's win a championship. I mean, that's how I look at it, you know? But you have young teams that, like, they know that that's not reality at the moment. Uh, but, like, you know, Atlanta Hawks – um you know we have a good team a couple you know veteran players couple young players um a good mix we started the season decent you know good and now we kind of lost like two games that like we could have should have win and you know but the season is long so you just gotta keep building you know mm-hmm. you play with a lot uh great uh, players uh, future hall of famers so if you would if you could pick uh players to all-time teammates uh, ben Odrich team who would you pick and teammate, there are two options with you at the point with you at the point guard or without you <laughs> it's up to you <laughs> uh i mean you you mean like who would be the best player or the best teammate the best teammate hmm um, I guess, you know, Mauro Ginobili, I mean, the Spurs times were really good. So I think I would pick all the players, you know, it was like, we had a really good chemistry, um, you know, Tony, Timmy, uh, Robert Ori, uh, Brent Berry, um, you know, there's a lot of players that like, I mean, I had a de- like really good relationship with, um, let's say, um, Boban Marjanovic, really good friend of mine, you know, like yeah, I saw the picture on the Instagram. Oh yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, we played together in Detroit. Um, who else? Uh, Goran Dragic, of course, in Miami. 
you know, I got to pick my Slovenian brother from another mother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but like, seriously, like, I mean, there is more good guys than bad guys in league. Um, and as a teammate, as a, you know, how they were to me, like, I never had an issue with a player. Um, I'm a problem. I try to be a problem solver. So even if I had an issue with player, I went to my teammate as like, hey, like, what's going on? You know, like, I always like, I couldn't go home and just like, nah, I'm off of him. I don't like him. Like, I, I had to go and talk to them, you know. So I was just trying to solve everything, trying to be good with everybody. After the season in the Pistons, uh, you played in Lithuania and in Zelgilis Kovno. And yes. again, the same uh, double situation, champion at the cup of the league. Mm -hmm. And this time, uh, coach was Sarunas Jasikiewicz. You know each other from the time when he played in Slovenia in uh, Union Olympia. Yeah. And this time, the role was different. He was your coach. Uh, how do you remember this cooperation with Sarunas, the European legend? <clears throat> I mean, he he knows basketball, and I think that sometimes, and he loves basketball, so sometimes that makes him uh, a little too, like, I would say, how would I say it? Like too emotional, you know, in a game. Like he, I think we're, like, I loved playing for him. I mean, he was a great, like, he knows he's got a great basketball mind. Like, and that's like, that's why we were so successful in Jagiris too, because like, he's got a good feel for the game. Like, so if you go back, like, We made the playoffs, um, um, but the thing is, like our plus minus, you know, in differential, in points differential, was, I think we were like plus eight. But then you had some other teams that didn't make the playoffs, and they were like plus fifty, plus sixty. They score more points than they got them. But the thing is, they were we were winning some certain games for like a small amount of points because of certain calls that he put in and like like during timeouts and you know special plays and stuff like that and that helped us a lot as a team um but yeah he's a i feel like he's just too emotional and sometimes i mean you you hear it now these days you know there's a few players that stated it like he he they wanted to be more have to have more trust from a coach and And again, you know, like not everybody can play for Sharunas, you know. You got to be mentally very strong, uh, I feel. Uh, but I think like, you know, he, overall, he's a good coach. Um, just very emotional, I would say, you know, very uh, um, aggressive at times, you know, and not physical, but just like it's mental, you know, uh, verbally aggressive. And like I said, again, he's got to be a good coach. I mean, he's a good coach, but he's got to... You got to be a certain player that can play for that, you know. So does this emotional aspect made that he play only two seasons in the NBA because he played as a 20 in 29 and he's 30. So he wasn't too old for the NBA. Uh, no, he wasn't too old, but I feel like, um, like, first of all, I'm kind of a thinking back, like when he decided certain teams, I don't know what the offer differential was, but I know he had two teams to go to. Uh, he went. Uh, he had a Boston Celtics and uh, Indiana Pacers. They offered him, and I don't know who offered him more money. Um, I guess but, Indiana. Uh, well, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I don't know why he chose Indiana because at that time, right before they signed him, they they extended Jamal Tinsley for like a big contract, and you know, coming from Europe, you're not gonna play in front of him. So. You know, and Sharunas was a leader on the court and he needs to play a certain amount of minutes to be able to showcase himself that he's a leader. And in the limited minutes that he came and he played for Indiana, I think that hurt him. Uh, I think at that time, it would be better move for him to go to Boston, you know. Uh, but anyways, he was still in, at that time when he came to the NBA, he was in his prime. And he was a number one point guard in Europe, you know. Um You know, and him going to college in in United States probably have him thinking like, oh, I want to play in NBA one day. So that's why he jumped over. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he had a great career uh, in Europe.
as a one of you know went down as a one of the legends and one of the best point guards that played the game so uh you know he did just fine <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but yeah it was a experience with Joe Gears was great I mean yeah like you said we won the cup like we won the championship and you know we were third in Europe in Euroleague so uh but it was really big big success so so experience. where is the more uh emotions on the crowd in Israel or in Lithuania oof they 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 both have definitely they both have a very good fans um you know one of them i had in the beginning of my career and one of the end of my career so uh obviously i remember jagir is better um but you know all i think in general a lot of european teams you know i can name you know panathinaikos then you have Olympiakos, then you have uh, Partizan and, and Red Star, Tervena Zvezda, you know, like you have like those teams that like the fans are very passionate and very involved. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Turkish, uh, you know, fans, like all these fans, like Sp Spanish fans are a little bit more laid back and stuff like that. And I would say German as well, Italian, some teams good, bad, like, you know, but like, yeah, like the earlier the, the teams that I named first those are the one of the best fans yeah Beno thank you very much for the time uh yeah, spent and uh, to our conversation in Opo stories from the NBA I'll start with uh, Slovenian uh, Dobridan so how will be a uh, goodbye in uh, Slovenian adio. adio 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 yes okay so Beno adio or, or adio live done yeah live done like nice day have a nice day yeah Okay, so with this Slovenian accent, we uh, end this episode of Opus Stories from the NBA. Thank you very much and have a nice day uh, in Colorado. Same, same to you. Okay, okay. goodbye. All right, bye.